I'm talking about kind of one little sliver of my PhD, which is the data collection portion, because I am looking at um, primarily entirely metal detected finds for my data set. Um, and I will kind of admit when I <laughs> submitted my abstract, I thought I was going to have a lot more answers to questions uh, with data collection that I was facing using things like PAS and working with metal detectors, because they are a fun group of people. <laughs> um, so, but I don't have the answers because shockingly a year and a half of a PhD is not long enough to answer questions that archaeologists have been discussing and debating since metal detecting started. So instead of answering questions, I'm just going to put forward a lot of questions at the end um, and tell you what I think of them. And then maybe you guys could tell me the answers because I don't know. But before that, I'll quickly tell you a little bit about my project just to give you some context. So I am looking at uh, Viking Age Lincolnshire and I'm looking at Anglo-Saxon and Viking Age Anglo-Scandinavian material to look at the transition um, in metalwork. Obviously, because I'm using the PS, as we just said. Um, so I am looking at stylistic design and production elements, so copper alloy uh, types, to see if there's a correlation with this incoming population. So over the last 20 years, the Portal Antiquity Scheme has really transformed our understanding of Viking Age England. Um, as thousands of items of metalwork have been reported that really reveal a strong Scandinavian influence in Eastern England, where the Scandinavian settlement was densest and modern agricultural regimes render metal detecting a really popular undertaking. So it is quite exciting. Um, but very quickly, so these are, I stood right in front of it, sorry, stand to the side. Um, so my research question is how can craft production reveal identity? And it's really more can craft production reveal identity? because I can look at all these things and determine that they are kind of producing copper in the same manner. Um, and the way I plan on doing this is by first and foremost establishing a method for determining producer identity between these two groups within Lincolnshire. Um, and I would like to make a more inclusive model um, that could be transferred from item to item, because as it stands, it's very item specific. So a lot of people think they could tell the difference between brooches or between strap ends, but there hasn't really been a widespread look at all of these dress accessories. And then from there, to fit it into a larger context, I'll reevaluate what I've learned um, and look at the Scandinavian impact, or maybe lack thereof. So uh, this graph is a little out of date now, but I think the impact is still pretty substantial. So a lot of times when I say I'm using a metal detected data set, um, I get kind of a scrunched up face from a lot of archaeologists because <laughs> there's a bit of um, they don't tend to like them as much as things that were found in their original context. So obviously, I think that metal detected finds still have a context. It's just not the original deposition one. It's an entirely new context that's usually the plow zone. Um, but as we can see, there are, in 2013, so this is just items of jewelry that are Anglo-Scandinavian. And there are 450 that were found through metal detecting, and only 14 found through excavation. And that's kind of pretty, pretty big difference. Um, so if we kind of continue, or if we ignore those metal detected finds just because they don't fit into the nice context we're used to, I think we're really doing a disservice to the Viking Age um, and to the early medieval period in general because it's such a wealth of data and we should be learning how to get as much as we can from the material. So what I'm looking at, I kind of said this already, but I'm using the PAS to talk about stylistic design and production markers. And a lot of those I can get from the finds entries because for the most part, they're very detailed and the photographs are quite good. Um, but I'm also doing PXRF, which is where things get a bit tricky. Um, so I'm doing this to test past theories about metal composition, because it's been theorized that Scandinavians were using brass while Anglo-Saxons were using bronze. And you need the actual object, which is why it's a bit tricky. But it's very quickly, it even is PXRF. Um, so I'm not going to go into a whole physics discussion with you guys. Don't worry. So. Um, basically, PXRF stands for Portable X-ray Florensis, and it's, uh, I don't, more people may have heard of XRF, but this is just a portable version, and it can tell you the elemental composition of items. Um, it's used for a range of things from metals, glass, pottery, dirt. Um, so, from so PXRF has a lot of positives, but it also has quite a lot of downsides. The primary positives are that it's a non-destructive way of testing it, so you could get much more detailed results like from, about compositions from isotope analysis, but that is destructive. So you'd have to chip away at the item. 
um, so kind of destroying it a bit. Whereas PXRF, you don't have to destroy it, but the information you get isn't quite as detailed. So what it's good for is really looking at broad alloy changes over either long periods of time or over big geographical areas because it's so finicky. So um, what I plan on doing is correlating the stylistic data that I can get from the fine entry with the copper alloy types. These are the different types of copper alloy types. Um, just for fun, this is what PXRF data looks like <laughs> uh, when you download it from the machine. So it is a nightmare and a half. Um, so obviously, as I PXRF things that are on the portable antiquity scheme, I do want to share that data because that's the whole point of the portable antiquity scheme is that it's meant to be open access and everyone can learn. But I am not going to send that to anyone. So it gets kind of tidied up. So this is kind of one object. And I've taken, so what I tend to do is I take a set amount of points on each side of the object and then it gets averaged out. So you get the average amount, not that one, that's what the, that's before it's corrected. So you get the average amount of each um, elemental composition in it. So what could be added to the fine centuries is more something looks like this. It's a little more digestible than that last um, graph. So one of the things I've been trying to do, this is one of the questions that I don't know the answer to yet, is can PXRF be incorporated into past recording? Um, this is a lovely picture of me trying to do some PXRF in the Fines Liaison's office, who's very nice to let me use his desk. Um, but so part of the issue is, well, first and foremost, is potential cost. So obviously um, the kit is quite expensive, but it's also additional labor um, and time and training someone in doing it that um, the British Museum, or KS, may not want to put forward. Um, but what I've been trying to do with some objects is as they're being recorded, Fine Zazon, who I work with in Lincolnshire, he'll send me a message and I'll go out there and record them, or um, zap them, as he's recording them. It's a very official term, you zap an item, zap it. <laughs> um, so the, I think it would be quite good if more scientific methods like this could be incorporated in, because like I was saying, PXRF is only really beneficial when you have a really large data set so my general rule of thumb is that I need at least 100 items for it to be statistically significant. So if we started doing this with recordings like the PIS, where items are constantly coming in, we could get a much bigger picture of um, alloy types and how um, they're maybe changing over time. So the other big issue with the PIS and trying to access material is who actually owns this material. So England and Wales are quite unique and that most of the items do get returned to the finder, which can make things like further analysis on them quite challenging. Um, and definitely when I started using metal detected finds, I was very pro, museums should get everything. No idea why they give metal detectors back anything. But obviously as you continue to work with metal detectors and this material, you start to realize that that might not actually be the best thing. Um, museums are overcrowded and so many things don't get put on display. And when you actually meet these detectorists, for the most part, they are very passionate and well-educated in what they're looking at. And they do take a lot of pride in the objects. And a lot of times you show up at their house, and it's a bit sketchy, um, you go to work with them and they will pull out material and constantly be showing it to you and be very excited and animated and thrilled that the material that they've kept and they value for their archeological uh, potential, not necessarily a financial one, they're excited that it's going to get used and continue this conversation and like benefit the discussion about archaeological heritage and yeah, continuing research. So I, yeah, this is a big question that I struggle with, especially because I also use um, other countries' uh, metal detecting website, or sorry. <laughs> um, so I also am looking at Danish material. So um, this is a screenshot of their past equivalent, I guess, called Dyne, which just launched um, October, at the end of September. Um, and so you could see from the very good Google Translate of the Danish take place. So <laughs> um, what that is, is so basically what they've done with Dyne is they made an app for your phone. So when you find something in the field, you can you take a picture of it right there. 
I don't mind me making that. Um, and you, a GPS pin is associated with that object and where you took the photo. So you can kind of see that all of these photos, they're not the best quality because you could tell so many of them are actually taken in the field. Um, but once you put that photo into the app, it generates the take place. <laughs> um, so it's basically the closest museum to them. And sorry, you could see I was looking at a certain region when I did this because it's all the same museum. But um, so basically, and then you have a certain amount of time before the detectors has to bring um, has to bring in that material. Um, so obviously, with things like PXRF, this is going to be a lot easier when I start scanning this material because I know exactly where it is and I know where it's stored. And so it's easier to find as opposed to going to a detector's home and him rummaging through things mm -hmm. to potentially try and find me what I'm looking for. Um, but what I think they did that's kind of clever is they tried to have a foot in both camps. So when they take the photo and generate this record, they also have a social media aspect. So they were talking about um, how part of the reason people like to metal detect is so they can show off what they found. So what they've done is you can, as you send this to Dime, you can also put it on Facebook. So you can share with your metal detecting communities and all of your friends, like look at the brooch I found. So it is a little bit of both. You get to show off what you found, but it still gets deposited in a museum. But um, there are some issues. So even already, there's like a backlog of material that isn't being recorded as quickly because it's a lot of these are going to like small museums. So they don't quite have the manpower, sorry, uh, the capacity to deal um, with recording the amount of stuff that might be coming in. So this is the big question I need to figure out. Uh, where do we go from here? So as kind of scientific methods improve on um, material culture, how do we try and get that data onto the things like the PAS, um, which is quickly becoming a big source of information for most students and academics? So how do we make sure, since they are void of their primary context, that we get the most information we can out of them as these scientific methods like PXRF and kind of microscopy? How do, how do we do it? How do we make sure it goes into the recording system and we learn as much from these materials as we can? That is it. Thank you. <laughs>